this presentation I'm, I'm going to give uh, is about ancient definitions of personhood and uh, depends mostly, I'm going to mostly be talking about, ironically, humanoid forms uh, of humanoid forms that uh, in, in, to the ancient mind had dubious uh, personhood, but I'll also be talking about animals. Um, so I'll be discussing the basic philosophical and legal standards applied to uh, defining the existential status of two artificial androids in particular, the homunculus and the golem, during the Middle Ages and Renaissance when their creation was actually considered possible and often believed to be accomplished fact. It'll also show uh, how the historical definition of personhood has generally coincided with Aristotle's notions, um, which Peter Singer talked about yesterday, um, that in which uh, Aristotle provides mainly to determine who's worthy of slavery. These sorts of historical stances on personhood are important because they show the difficult social precedents facing any redefinition of non-human personhood today. Uh, just to note, just so that you know, these ideas in this talk derive from my book, which was published uh, by Rutledge this last uh, January. So the earliest descriptions of the creation of an artificial man called a homunculus by the alchemists exists in a work that probably dates from the late Roman Empire, uh, a book of magic called the Book of the Cow, or Libra Vacaea, which gives an actual recipe for creating a homunculus. This consists basically of mixing human sperm with a phosphorescent stone and then putting that mixture, inserting that mixture into the womb of a sheep or a cow, and then once the, uh, that humanoid is born, feeding the humanoid on blood to make it grow. Now, there are several things of interest to us here. Uh, first is the use of animals, presumably unwilling, uh, as surrogate birth mothers for this artificial human. The other is that this first uh, recipe we have for artificial genesis indicates that it's specifically for creating a being that's seen as expendable, uh, expendable chattel, as a matter of fact, for the creator's convenience, a disposable human servant, and one with supernormal, miraculous power to boot. The point of the creation process is to produce a humanoid that, and I'm quoting here, if a man has raised it and nourished it until a whole year passes and left it in milk and rainwater, it will tell him about all distant things and occurrences. Moreover, this humanoid has the power to influence the progress of the moon or to change a person into a cow or a sheep. Or, and here's the expendable aspect, it can be cut open while alive, and its bodily fluids, when applied to the feet, will allow its maker to walk on water. Note here the unflinching, almost offhanded mention of vivisecting a human and smearing its fluids on one's feet. This, clearly linked, this is clearly linked with its status as a subhuman and a slave. Now, more on this topic later. In the Renaissance, the notion of the homunculus was most closely associated with Theophrastus von Hohenheim, uh, better known as Paracelsus, who gave the most detailed descriptions of this creature and how to make it. In De Natura Rerum, On the Nature of Things, he describes in much greater detail how this creature is made than in the Libra Vatea, giving readers a detailed recipe for making one. And the recipe reads as follows. I'm quoting him here. Let the semen of a man putrefy by itself in a sealed curcubite, a flask, with the highest putrefaction of horse manure for 40 days or until it begins at last to live, move, and be agitated, which can be easily seen. After this time, it will be in some degree like a human being, but nevertheless transparent and without body. If now, after this, it be every day nourished and fed cautiously and prudently with the arcanum of human blood and kept for 40 weeks in the perpetual and equal heat of horse manure, it becomes thenceforth a true and living, and by the way, horse manure um, it isn't just a, a gross out technique of, of the alchemist. Uh, it has a steady state, horse manure has a steady state of exothermic reaction. It releases heat at a steady basis. So they used it uh, to, uh, as a, a constant heat source. So um, if this is done, uh, the, the little homunculus will become henceforth a true and living infant, having all the members of a child that is born from a woman, but much smaller. This we call a homunculus, and it should afterwards be educated with the greatest care and zeal until it grows up 
and begins to display intelligence. Now we can see from Paracelsus' prime focus on the putrefaction of substances or on their digestion, as he calls it in another passage, that the focus for this recipe is on a process more like spontaneous generation than human reproduction. The important thing to remember about spontaneous generation is that this generative process was the process by which from ancient times many lower creatures, such as insects, were thought to originate spontaneously from rotting organic matter. The connection of the homunculus with this process implies again its low status relative to its maker. Around the same time and in the same context as Paracelsus, Cornelius Agrippa von Nettesheim um, also mentions the making of a homunculus. Like Paracelsus, Agrippa practiced medicine, believed in discovery through experimentation and observation, which was radical for their day, and had many public disagreements with authority, although his were generally with the church rather than the medical establishment. In his um, De Aculta Philosophia, Three Books of Occult Philosophy, Agrippa discusses how the spontaneous generation of living things is made possible um, uh, uh, is made possible by using the proper mixture of natural elements under the proper astrological influence. Among other creatures produced like this, such as frogs generated from dried powdered duck mixed with water, Agrippa mentions the homunculus. Again, the artificial man here is grouped with animals, and the animals in turn are seen as objects. They can be dried and powdered like inert materials and reconstituted later by adding water. So let's talk about the homunculus as artificial servant, and that's, uh, uh, I think, a significant um, issue. An important connection between the two men's descriptions is their use of the term natural to describe animate humanoid things not born of human parents. So they're called, this is a natural, this, you would be a natural if you weren't born from a human uh, parent. It's a, a, a broad term. Paracelsus states of the homunculus that philosophers name such creatures naturals, and Agrippa discusses naturals in his De Oculta, and his more detailed explanation of them is pretty revealing. In the context of mathematics, and what he calls the many wonderful works which are done by mathematical arts only, he asserts this. Of mathematical doctrines only, works like to naturals can be produced. As Plato saith, a thing not partaking of truth or divinity, but certain images akin to them, as bodies going or speaking, which yet want the animal faculty, such as were those amongst the ancients were called Daedalus's images and automata, of which Aristotle makes mention. Now the passage makes several things clear. First, Agrippa considers naturals kin to automata, that is, mechanical dolls. Second, the context in which Aristotle makes mention of Daedalus's images and automata in Aristotle's politics is in contemplating the idea of a more convenient slave. So, it's implicit that Agrippa thinks of homunculi, as well as other naturals and automata, as slaves too. Indeed, like Aristotle, who justifies slavery in part by contending that non-Greeks are not fully human, and so can, like mules, can be used as natural slaves, Agrippa sees all naturals as something less than human. What Agrippa means when he defines naturals like the homunculus as things not partaking of truth or divinity but certain images akin to them, is that they lack a soul. In other words, the term natural designates any apparently living, humanoid thing that is not really human, but simply a product of nature's elements, without the presumably divine component, the soul, inherent in humans. So, besides showing that both Agrippa and Paracelsus are talking about the same sorts of human simulacra, the term natural provides insight into this kind of creature's low place in the cosmic order, relative to humans. <coughs> because of its lowly status, we can see it, uh, an implicit reason for Paracelsus' reference to homunculi in his De Vita Longa, which is a, 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 a treatise on long life, as something to be used like animals. For despite their subhuman status, they have supernormal aptitudes, spirit-like abilities to know hidden and secret things, and great forceful beast-like strength. And the fact that they're akin to machines, as animals too are implicitly, um, provides a justification for using them as slaves. Animals and automata have no souls. The inclusion of homunculi and wild people in the same category as animals and automata makes their use as servants ethically acceptable. 
This ethical convenience is implicit not only in Agrippa's comparison of naturals and animals, for that matter, to machines, which anticipates some extreme Cartesian views in the early 18th century of all living things as organic machines, with humans differing in their possession of souls, but also in Paracelsus' references to them in a book on nymphs as either beasts or things. So it's no coincidence that Paracelsus' judgments that naturals, despite all of their powers, were inferior to humans, and that this inferiority was based on deficiencies in reason and intelligence, sound much like statements made by the era's apologists for enslavement of the American Indians. As Anthony Pagnin points out, Paracelsus was among a number of thinkers of his time who lumped American Indians together with nymphs, satyrs, giants, and pygmies as wild men. He had two reasons for this. First, Paracelsus thought the two groups bred in the same way through a form of spontaneous generation. He thought Indians arose from rotting organic matter. The other more prominent justification was that these barbarians, and I'm using his term here, had a lack of reason. This follows Aristotle's definition of the natural slave, uh, and men such as uh, Juan Inés de Sepúlveda, Gil Gregorio, Bernardo de Mesa, and the Scottish theologian John Meyer, all of the Renaissance, um, asserted that the natives of the New World, because they lacked the ability to, to deliberate or reason in any significant way, according to them, uh, were, despite their prowess in war, agriculture, and other things, somewhere between beast and human, and hence they could be forced into servitude. This was their legal standpoint. This formulation of the homunculus as both slave and super powerful tool triggered significant debate among Europeans, as did the treatment of the American Indians, believe it or not. And what I'm about to say anticipates um, not only animal rights debates, uh, but also debates about creating artificial intelligence today. Some European scholars of the Renaissance, such as the medieval, uh, and medieval commentators, I should say, such as the medieval commentator Pseudo Thomas, seem to agree with the view that the homunculus was subhuman and so available for exploitation by its creator. Other Europeans don't agree with this kind of definition. Some of them disagree because they see such treatment of any kind of animal as immoral, and others because they differ with Pseudo Thomas's view of the creature's soul. William of Auvergne advocates the first of these views. Interestingly, in his treatise on laws, De Legibus, he denounces the practices specified in the Book of the Cow on the grounds that it's wrong to create artificial animals of any kind just so they can be killed for other purposes. An interesting view, uh, considering this was in the Middle Ages. Let's move now to talk about the golem. The, um, the, the idea of creating the, a golem first appears in late 12th century Jewish commentary on the Sefer Yetzirah, the Book of Life, a Kabbalistic text. Um, although the roots of the idea that a human could create living things by ritualistic uh, and religious magic go back much further. As Gershom Sholem, the most authoritative source on the history of the golem in Jewish thought, notes, the idea that God's act of creation might be repeated uh, or done by magic and other arts has its origin in the legends recorded in the Talmud concerning certain famous rabbis of the third or fourth centuries. Many others think that the Sefer Yetzirah um, itself may be older than the Middle Ages, and the medieval commentators on that book mention that figures of the remote past, such as Abraham and Jer Jeremiah, had actually managed to use the knowledge contained in the Sefer Yetzirah to uh, create living beings. So, as with the homunculus, the association of uh, the golem with automata, as well as its subhuman status, implies a servile status uh, for the creature. By the 16th century, the golem does, in fact, come to be rep represented mainly as an artificial servant rather than the mere product of a devotional exercise. Significantly, this transformation of the golem from a simple creation meant to signify its creator's holiness and wisdom to a useful slave happens around the same time as the advent of the homunculus and the enslavement of the American Indians in the 16th century. A manuscript from that time constitutes the oldest known record of the servant golem. Um, in the document, it's noted that Samuel the Pious, a rabbi, had created a golem who could not speak, but who accompanied him on his long journeys through Germany and France and waited on him. 
The, these servant golems were usually depicted as mute, importantly, which is seen in an echo of Aristotelian standards of servitude uh, that I talked about before as a mark of their inferiority to humans and their lack of reason. As Sholem explains, those who contended that the golem could not speak used a rationale similar to Aristotle's. The power of speech is the chief sign of reason, which in turn is the key defining characteristic of what is human. So to conclude, we can see that definitions of personhood have historically relied not just on anthropocentric, but also cultural-centric views, such as whether someone could speak one's own language, much less speak at all, and whether they wore clothing similar to one's own or had a body similar to one's own, and such ancient views of non-human persons as the homunculus and the golem, therefore, point to the stubbornness with which we hang on to the convenience of our chauvinistic definitions of what is human and what is subhuman. If we want to persist in clinging to our sense of our own exceptionality, as did Aristotle's Greeks, and to have the convenience of designating all but our own tribe as subhuman, uh, so that we can use them as objects for unsavory purposes, then we'll continue as we have for the last 2,500 years, relegating all but ourselves to our, and our private circle to expendability, or worse, designating them as enemies. And that will not only impoverish us, but will also threaten Earth's balance and our very existence. Thank you.